Hello and welcome to Pantai Hospitals EPO's Facebook Live event today. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Today we will be talking about a very important endocrine gland which serves multiple functions in the human body, the thyroid gland. Feel free to keep your questions towards the end and raise it at the end of the session today. Let's start off now. We will be going through a few things today. The first will be introducing the thyroid gland itself, and we will go through several disorders of the thyroid gland, encompassing hypothyroidism, which is excess of the thyroid hormone, hypothyroidism, which is inadequate secretion of thyroid hormone in the body, thyroid nodules or cancer, as well as inflammation of the thyroid, termed thyroiditis. Now let's go through the thyroid gland first. Okay, what is a thyroid gland? It's a small organ that's located in the front of the neck, wrapped around the windpipe, which is our trachea. It's shaped like a butterfly, smaller in the middle, with two white wings that extend around the side of your throat. Essentially, the thyroid gland is an endocrine gland, which secretes hormones which are important in human function. As you can see here, this is the front view of the thyroid. We have a right lobe, a left lobe, as well as an isthmus, which joins both the lobes. And at the back view, we can see that we also have additional glands called the parathyroid glands. We have four of them. Some are in this location. Sometimes they are in different sites. Uh, parathyroid glands serve a separate function, but essentially they share the same uh, blood supply and nerve supply from the thyroid gland as well. The thyroid gland serves multiple functions in the human body. It secretes three different hormones. We have the thyroxine called T4 hormone, T3, which is triiodothyronine, as well as calcitonin. Now, T4 and T3 serves multiple functions in terms of the heart function. It controls our heart rate, heart rhythm as well. It aids in digestion, brain development, and nervous system function. In, very importantly, it has a role in bone health as well as muscle contractions. So understandably, when we have a disruption in the thyroid hormone secretion, be it excess or inadequate secretion, we have issues in all these different systems in the human body. It also serves calcitonin. And calcitonin is a hormone which helps to keep our bone healthy, as well as aids in the parathyroid hormone production, which I talked about earlier, as well as clearance of certain electrolytes and metabolites from the body as well. Now let's look about how this thyroid hormone is actually secreted. We have a higher center called the hypothalamus, which is somewhere deep in the brain, which connects to the pituitary gland. Now the pituitary gland is actually a master center, or it's, it's the main pituitary or powerhouse, which secretes multiple different hormones in the body. So the hypothalamus sends signals to the pituitary gland to actually send further hormones such as TSH to stimulate the thyroid gland, subsequently inducing the thyroid gland to secrete T4, which is thyroxine, T3, triiodothyronine, as well as calcitonin in our body. So if there's any problem at any one level of the hypothalamus or the pituitary or even the gland at the neck itself, it can cause several different disorders in the human body. Now, let's, let's look at hyperthyroidism. Hypothyroidism is an overactive thyroid. It occurs when your thyroid gland produces too much of the hormone thyroxine. You can have an excess of T4, thyroxine, or an excess of T3, thyroidothyronine. T4 is essentially the inactive hormone, and it requires the liver, muscle, and kidney to activate these hormones to the T3 hormones. So when you have hypothyroidism, what are the telltale signs? You may have bulging eyes, a neck swelling called goiter, swelling of your legs or skin lesions over your legs, increased heart rate or irregular heart rates, and that may be felt as palpitations in, in you, tremors of your hands, feeling very jittery, uh, anxious or nervous, feeling hungry all the time, um, inappropriate or uh, weight loss, which is um, even though you have a, uh, you feel hungry, you actually lose a lot of weight, as well as hair loss and breathing problems. Some people actually have a lot of mood swings, feeling nervous, irritable at times as well with hyperthyroidism. What are the causes of hyperthyroidism? The commonest cause of hyperthyroidism is a condition known as Graves' disease. This is an autoimmune disease, which I will elaborate further. 
Second cause is toxic nodules or toxic swellings of the thyroid. It can be single, it can be multiple. Inflammation of the thyroid gland from external uh, insults such as viral infections, etc. External sources of thyroid hormone. Some of these um, traditional medications that we buy over the counter, online, actually contain a lot of thyroid hormones and they claim to aid in weight loss um, and stuff like that, which are abused by certain people. So these, are, these may be external sources of thyroid hormone which can cause problems in the human body. Other causes are drugs and contrasts that are used for scans or other causes of the pituitary, um, uh, pituitary disorders, which I'm not going to talk about in this, uh, talk, in this talk today. Now let's go and see what is Graves' disease. It's the commonest cause of hyperthyroidism. Basically, what is autoimmunity? Uh, we all have an uh, immune system that works against um, insults such as bacteria and viruses in our body. So when the immune system acts against our own organs, due to autoantibodies, we call this autoimmunity. It's a state where we have autoantibodies which attack the cells of our body, causing a lot of problems in terms of hormones and other related diseases as well. So as you can see in this diagram here, we have antibodies which stimulate the TSH receptor in the thyroid, and this causes overproduction of hormones causing hyperthyroidism. So this state is called Graves' disease. And these patients may have a personal or family history of other autoimmune diseases, such as SLE, type 1 diabetes, etc. What are the signs or telltale signs of Graves' disease? You may have a diffuse, meaning the whole thyroid gland is uniformly enlarged, diffuse goiter or thyroid swelling. You may have thyroid-related infiltrative skin changes. This may be hyperpigmentation, as you can see here, darkened areas over the uh, shin areas. Uh, this usually occurs at the pre-tibial region. You may have swelling in these areas because of hyaluronic acid deposition in these areas. It can be as severe as causing elephantiasis even. Eyes can be affected in Graves' disease. You may have a retraction of your eyelids. As you can see here, the retraction of the eyelids cause the bulging eye appearance in these patients. Further inflammation can cause redness, swelling, and it can also cause difficulty in moving towards certain directions of the eye. It can affect the muscles of the eye, causing muscle paralysis of the eye. And in certain circumstances, when the eye is exposed for very long periods, it can cause corneal scarring and ulceration, as you can see in diagram C below. So you have a spectrum of um, thyroid eye diseases which range from mild moderate to even severe diseases. And usually these patients will require um, a specialist or ophthalmologist consult. Okay, other um, are not very significant signs are swelling of the fingers and toes, which can be seen here, are called thyroid acropathy. Okay, so what are the things that we usually do to assess whether a patient, has, what is the cause of the hyperthyroidism in patients? First and foremost, we look at your thyroid function test to look at how high your thyroid functions are. Is, is there a suppression of your TH level? And how high are your T3 and T4 hormones? Secondly, we would do an ultrasound of the thyroid. In Graves' disease, as you can see in the diagram on the right here, you would have a hypervascular state or basically your thyroid is very active with a lot of blood vessels and it's in a very hyperactive state showing a positive Doppler. As you can see, a color Doppler here on the right side whereas a normal thyroid probably will not be as active as that. So usually in Graves' disease, you would have a hyperactive thyroid with increased vascular flow, which can be seen by Doppler ultrasound. But in certain diseases such as um, thyroiditis, you may not see this picture, but they may have a high T4 and T3 as well. So we'll, these are some of the things that we use to actually look for the causes of hyperthyroidism. Additional testings can be TSH receptor antibodies, this costs around two to 300 ringgit in the private hospital. These receptors are specific biomarkers for the diagnosis of Graves' disease. So basically we are testing for that specific antibody that disturbs the thyroid function. And if this is positive, around more than 90%, we can confirm that you have Graves' disease. Thyroid scan is an uptake scan using radionuclide material to see if there are nodules that are secreting excess thyroid hormones in the body. These are also used, but generally we rely on ultrasounds and the receptor antibodies. Now let's look at other causes of hyperthyroidism. We can have a single toxic nodule, as you can see here, a solitary toxic nodule that secretes um, high, hormone, uh, high uh, concentrations of T4 and T3, or we can also have multiple nodules that secrete uh, excess T3 and T4 hormone. Other causes, as you can see down here, are thyroiditis, which is inflammation of the thyroid gland. 
which I will go through in a bit. Now, what are the options of treatment for hyperthyroidism? The first and foremost, first line treatment option would be antithyroid medications. We have a few medications available to treat. Uh, basically, these are oral drugs which are prescribed by their doctor. Second option would be radioiodine therapy, which uh, usually it's part of nuclear medicine therapy. And the last um, but not least, we have removal of the thyroid gland, which is called a thyroidectomy. So what are the antithyroid medications that we have? We have carbimazole, which, are com which is commonly used, and propylthiouracil. These medications come in uh, 5 milligram or 50 milligram tablets. So based on the degree of hyperthyroidism, you will be prescribed probably six or eight tablets, and then the doctor will ask you to taper it down over a few weeks, and you will be put on a maintenance dose of maybe one or two tablets for a longer period of time if you have Graves' disease. Essentially, Graves' disease treatment runs for a year and a half to two years. Subsequently, we will try to taper off the medications and see if you are in remission without the medication. Another important aspect of antithyroid medications are heart rate control with medications, as you can see in the right-hand uh, right corner here, which is propanolol. We have other medications to reduce your heart rate as well, which I won't go through here. But these medications are important to reduce the sympathetic drive of the hyperthyroid effect in the body. And our aim of heart rate control would be less than 90 in patients with hyperthyroidism. It's important to note that these medications, carbimazole and propylthiouracil, have got certain side effects. And usually, you'd be advised that if you have any fever, cough, runny nose, redness of your eyes or sore throat, to go to the nearest clinics to get a full blood count checked to make sure that your white blood cell doesn't drop, as this is one of the feared complications of the disease. But the rates remain very low, as low as 0.3% per patient. So um, the second side effect that can occur is hepatotoxicity or liver involvement, liver derangement, which is also low in rate up to 03 to 0.4%. So doctors who prescribe this medication will usually periodically order for a liver function tests to make sure that your liver is in a normal state. Okay, what is radioactive iodine therapy? This is a nuclear medicine-based therapy. It is a safe, well-tolerated treatment that targets thyroid cells specifically so that there's little exposure to the rest of your body cells. It's given in a capsule or liquid form. And we have, um, from Ipoh, usually we refer the patients to Hospital Kuala Lumpur or Putrajaya or Hospital Pulau Pinang for this particular form of treatment. And it's given to make sure that the patient becomes hypothyroid or um, make, make the patient into a state of low thyroid hormone, which will require lifelong hormone replacement therapy. So essentially, we want to make the thyroid gland inactive and give them a safer form of therapy, which is thyroid hormone replacement, which is a more natural form, not a synthetic uh, chemical, which will be a lifelong hormone replacement. Who needs radioactive iodine therapy. So we have certain patients who are unable to take the oral medications due to side effects. For example, they have a very bad side effect to oral medications or after giving them treatment for a year and a half to two, they don't go into remission. Or we have certain subset of patients who are, have very difficult to control thyroid hormone, um, uh, thyroid disease. Uh, they persistently hyperthyroid despite giving them high doses of medications. These are the patients that would benefit from radioactive iodine therapy. Safe to say it's actually a well-tolerated treatment and it renders the gland hypothyroid for life. The third and um, I would say more um, definitive uh, management would be a removal of a thyroid gland. In a patient who is hyperthyroid, we usually go for total thyroidectomy, which is removal of the entire thyroid gland. Hemithyroidectomy may be considered, for example, in a patient who has a toxic nodule, which I showed earlier. So you want to remove that particular nodule that secretes the excess hormone. In that condition, you would do a hemithyroidectomy or half or partial removal of the thyroid gland. So what are the complications of uncontrolled hyperthyroidism? A lot of our patients take it very lightly and they miss medications sometimes two to three times a week and they come in with complications after a year or few months of being in an uncontrolled hyperthyroid state. They can run into cardiovascular problems. You can have heart failure, which causes difficulty in breathing, swelling of your lower limbs, and uh, difficulty even walking short steps. These are all symptoms of heart failure, which can be caused by uncontrolled hypothyroidism. Okay, another thing is um, high levels of 
thyroid hormone for long periods can have a very damaging effect on your bone and it can actually lead to osteoporosis, especially when you're postmenopausal and you're a female. Ophthalmopathy, as I mentioned, uh, complications to the eyes, which can go from mild, moderate to even very severe ophthalmopathy and can even cause uh, blindness and sight-threatening complications. Dermopathy are basically um, skin issues and the most feared complication of uncontrolled hypothyroidism is thyrotoxic crisis or thyrotoxic storm, which I will talk about. So patients with uh, hypothyroidism, especially if it's very poorly controlled and you have issues controlling it, should be referred to an endocrinologist or a specialist at diagnosis. Thyroid storm is, as I said, a life-threatening condition. Uh, patients, sometimes newly diagnosed patients come in in this condition. And most of the time, patients who are on treatment but do not take the medications properly or are not compliant come in with this condition. So symptoms are very high heart rates, exceeding 120 beats per minute, irregular heart rates, high fever, difficulty in breathing. Some may even have chest pain, very agitated, restless and confused, or even having mood swings, diarrhea, and it can lead to unconsciousness. So this is uh, an emergency and the patients need ICU care and the treatment is entirely different and they need hospitalization. So if you are a thyroid patient and you are taking medications, please look out for these signs as even if you are taking medications, there is a risk of you going into a relapse and these are the uh, telltale signs of a thyroid storm. Let's now look at hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism is the opposite of hyperthyroidism. It's a condition where your thyroid gland does not make enough thyroid hormone, it's underactive. So you have low T4, low T3 no, uh, levels. Some people may have, uh, it, it differing, uh, depends on the severity. Some people may have increased TSH levels, even though their T4 is normal. That's called a condition called uh, subclinical hypothyroidism, where we may choose to treat or not depending on the symptoms that the patient has. What are the symptoms of hypothyroidism? You may have thinning of hair, puffy face, dry and coarse skin, difficult to pass motion, constipation, very cool, always feeling very cold all the time, slow heartbeat. You may have a neck swelling. And for females, you may have infertility or heavy menstruation. And you'll basically feel very slow and tired, sleeping most of the time. You may gain weight and have poor memory as well. So these are some of the symptoms of hypothyroidism. Causes of hypothyroidism, again, Autoimmunity is the commonest cause, and these antibodies are a little bit different from the ones that cause hyperthyroidism. This one, uh, these antibodies are called anti-TPO antibodies, causing Hashimoto's thyroiditis or Hashimoto's disease. In some patients whom have, who have removed the thyroid gland or has gone for radioactive iodine therapy, when they are not treated optimally, can also cause hypothyroidism. Certain infiltrative diseases and drugs may also affect the thyroid. For example, uh, patients that are on cardiac drugs like amiodarone can affect the thyroid. Lithium drugs can also, uh, which are used for antipsychotics, uh, anti anti can also affect the thyroid gland. Treatment for hypothyroidism is basically thyroxine replacement. We usually, in, in Malaysia, we have two different kinds of formulations. We have euthyrox, we have levothyroxine, and they come in 25 to 50 mic um, tablets. 25 mics are generally used for the pediatric uh, group of patients. So these hormones are generally natural hormones and are safer in replacement compared to being on high doses of um, antithyroid medications for hyperthyroid instead. A uh, thing to note that um, on liver thyroxine therapy, a few things that you need to take note is that this medication is very sensitive. It needs to be taken on an empty stomach, preferably half an hour to an hour prior to any meal. So we usually advocate patients to take it the first thing in the morning, empty stomach with about 120 mils to 200 mils of water. And then after an hour, take your breakfast because it needs an acidic environment in the stomach to, for, its, for its optimal absorption. So, and it also requires a medication separation. For example, if you're taking any other multivitamins, any antihypertensives or any medications, you would prefer it to be taken at least two to four hours later from the time you took the thyroxine replacement. So common causes of thyroid, thyroid uh, hormone not being adequately replaced would be taking these medications with food or taking it um, together with other medications which would affect the absorption of these tablets. Thyroid nodules are solid or fluid-filled lumps that form within your thyroid. So you may present to the doctor saying, doctor, I feel 
um, I have a swelling in my thyroid. And this may be due to nodules. So when you go to a doctor initially for assessment of the thyroid nodule, they will look at it and say, okay, first of all, we'll take a blood test and see whether it is functional or not, meaning is your thyroid hormone high, is your thyroid hormone low? So are you in a hyperthyroid state or a hypothyroid state or are you euthyroid? Euthyroid means there is no uh, abnormalities of the thyroid hormone. They next look into symptoms suggestive of cancer. For example, is the nodule rapidly increasing in size? Is there any pain or is there any hoarseness of voice? Is there any change in voice or character uh, in terms of the, the neck swelling? Okay, subsequently, they'll also ask about is there any difficulty breathing? Is there difficulty swallowing? Is it causing um, difficulty for you to actually eat? You know, all these are called compressive symptoms. And subsequently, we, we will assess for possible causes of it. We'll ask for a family history of thyroid disease, any previous history of irradiation or chemotherapy done, and the rate of growth of these swellings. Now, history that suggests that it is cancer is that when you uh, we were younger, childhood or adolescence age, there may be a history of external neck irradiation. If it's rapidly growing in size, or there are recent changes in speaking, breathing, or swallowing, or a family history of thyroid cancer, we would be more inclined to think whether or not it is possibly a cancer. The doctor will probably assess you as well and examine um, the neck to see the consistency of the nodule itself. Is it firm to hard in consistency? Is it irregular in shape? Is it fixed to underlying or overlying tissues? Or is there a change in your voice, meaning a vocal cord involvement, or are their lymph nodes enlarged? So this can be done by physical examination um, in the office itself. Subsequently, we will do blood tests to see if the hormone, there is an excess of hormone thy uh, thyroid hormones or inadequate thyroid hormones, and is there a need for antibody testing, as I mentioned earlier. We would also do a thyroid ultrasound to look for changes suggesting cancer. There is a system of reporting which are used by radiologists called the ACR TREX 27. This reporting system is used by radiologists, very structured reporting system to tell us what are the characteristics, what are the likelihood of this nodule being a cancer. And based on scoring, we subsequently advise the patient regarding the need for a thyroid nodule biopsy. These are examples of a benign thyroid nodule on the top and malignant thyroid nodule at the bottom. So there are certain characteristics that would tell the radiologist whether this is malignant or benign. Okay, so this is an image of a thyroid nodule biopsy. Essentially, we use an ultrasound. It's done in the office. It's just a 20 minute to 30 minute procedure where you insert um, a small needle will be inserted via ultrasound guidance to the particular nodule to aspirate as much fluid or tissue possible. And it'll be sent to the lab to assess and see what they find on the histopathological examination. It's relatively um, not a very painful procedure. They'll give you local anesthetic or medications to numb that area. This is the Bethesda system of reporting that particular histopathological examination from the FNAC of the thyroid. As you can see here, we have six different categories which give us um, estimate of the malignancy rate. So as you go higher in terms of the category, the rate of malignancy increases. And this gives us a suggested treatment modality. So for example, if it's a category one, we'll probably repeat it later on, uh, maybe after three to six months. However, if it's a category five or six, you would most likely require a lobectomy, meaning removal of a lobe or a total thyroidectomy because the malignancy rate or the rate of a cancer can be as high as 60 to 90% in these two categories. So this is how we actually assess and go about managing a thyroid nodule. Thyroid cancers, we have four different types. The commonest cancer type is papillary thyroid cancer, affecting about 80% of thyroid cancer patients. Many of them do not experience any symptoms. Second commonest is follicular cancer, followed by medullary thyroid cancer, as well as anaplastic tumors. Anaplastic tumors are the least common. However, they are very aggressive. Luckily, papillary cancer is the commonest type that we have um, for now. In terms of treatment principles, the very first thing that we need to do if we find out that it's possibly a thyroid cancer is removal of the thyroid gland itself. And we'd usually do a total thyroidectomy because we do not want it to spread to other areas. 
Subsequently, we will use ablation or radioactive iodine therapy. This one is a little bit different from the hyperthyroid uh, treatment. This uses higher doses of radioactive iodine therapy and will require scans as well. And these are all done in the nuclear medicine department. Subsequently, since the thyroid gland is removed, you will require thyroid scene replacement and we'll replace it to um, much um, higher levels, which depends on the target, depending on what, uh, how far the thyroid, home, thyroid cancer has spread. For example, if it's localized, we have separate targets, but if it's, uh, it's metastasized or it's actually spread beyond the thyroid gland, your targets are different for suppressive therapy. And these patients will require regular follow-up and monitoring as well. Let's now look at thyroiditis. Itis the, actually means inflammation of the thyroid gland. Thyroiditis can lead to over or under production of thyroid hormones. I'm going to go through the commonest types of thyroiditis that we see here. Subacute granulomatous thyroiditis is actually very common. It's precipitated by a viral infection. It can be from any sort of adenovirus, even mumps, measles, coxsackie virus, or even COVID virus, which triggers inflammation of the thyroid cells causes excessive thyroid hormone secretion. So these patients usually report a very painful thyroid gland. So pain doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. Usually cancer patients do not complain of pain. Usually pain refers to inflammation of a thyroid gland. So it may be painful. They may have fever for a few days, unwell, difficulty in swallowing. And when you do a blood test, it shows a high thyroid level. So all these uh, symptoms point toward a inflammation instead of a excess thyroid or autoimmune cause. That's how we assess and say, okay, this is possibly a thyroiditis instead of Graves' disease. Treatment for subacute granulomatous thyroiditis is a little bit different. We usually give steroids to suppress the inflammation and we give them these heart rate control agents to bring down the heart rate to less than 90. Another condition we have here is after delivery called postpartum thyroiditis where after giving birth, there is inflammation of the thyroid gland. This is a little bit associated with um, antibodies as well, but this may not be painless, and the patients may complain of feeling hypothyroid symptoms, weight gain, uh, poor memory, feeling tired, lethargic, etc. And when you do a blood test, it shows uh, low thyroid hormones, and that's when we suspect postpartum thyroiditis. Now, these two kinds of thyroiditis can actually cause long-term hypothyroidism. So regular follow-up of these patients, even after the symptoms have disappeared, is very important. This is a different kind of thyroiditis called acute suppurative thyroiditis, where you have pain, fever, um, swinging pains actually, as well as redness of the skin overlying the thyroid gland itself. And when you do an ultrasound, you may be able to see collection of pus or abscess under the skin. And this requires immediate admission, drainage of the pus and antibiotics. So as I said earlier, thyroiditis, the treatment depends on the cause of it itself. We may give anti-inflammatory medications such as steroids. We will bring down the heart rate by beta blockers and we may need to replace the thyroid hormone if it is low. Let's go through COVID and thyroid disease now. So COVID has caused a lot of um, issues in terms of thyroid. COVID vaccines itself can have an effect on the thyroid gland and COVID infection itself can have a different effect on the thyroid gland. So the direct virus infection can cause an inflammatory response and it can also cause an immune response. So some patients actually have antibodies because of COVID infection and some patients have pain and it causes thyroiditis in this particular patients. So we can, we can see the spectrum of diseases which um, can be caused by COVID-19, the thyroid gland can be hyperthyroidism or thyroid toxicosis, which is high thyroid hormones, hypothyroidism, which is low thyroid hormones, or it can cause a non-thyroidal illness syndrome in patients who are admitted for COVID-19, which means that the whole system is actually suppressed and you need to repeat the thyroid function later on in life. It's just important to know that if you have symptoms that correlate with a recent thyroid infection or recent uh, COVID vac a recent COVID infection or recent COVID vaccination, just be aware that you may need to repeat your thyroid function test, have a look at it and get it assessed by the doctor. That concludes my talk for today. Thank you very much for the attention. Now we'll give time for any questions. Okay, we, we have a question here. How can I keep my thyroid healthy? 
Okay, thyroid essentially is a gland uh, that is uh, can be insulted by multiple viruses. Uh, smoking can actually cause thyroid diseases as well. Being a male and a smoker has a very bad prognostic implication, especially if you have Graves' disease. So keeping thyroid healthy requires basically healthy food, exercise, not smoking, uh, not consuming excessive amounts of alcohol and basically being healthy. Some patients are predisposed to thyroid diseases because they have autoimmune diseases, as I mentioned earlier, such as type 1 diabetes or SLE. In these patients, basically, they need to keep an eye and monitor if they have any symptoms to suggest thyroid disease. Okay, is there a permanent cure to thyroid problems? Someone has asked. A permanent cure would mean going for radioactive iodine therapy or removal of the thyroid gland. Antithyroid medications generally don't offer a permanent cure, rather it controls the hyperthyroid state. However, going for radioactive iodine therapy or removal of the thyroid gland is a definitive management option and they will require lifelong hormone therapy until the end. So I hope I've answered that question. Are there any more questions? Will thyroid disease affect other parts or organs of our body? Yes, as I mentioned earlier, it can affect the cardiovascular system, it can affect bone health, it can affect the skin, it can also affect the digestive system and the whole body's basal metabolic rate and the eye as well. So these are all the organs that can be affected by the thyroid system and any abnormalities that you feel or any symptoms that you feel that are related to these organs may mean a thyroid disease and you need to get it checked. Someone has asked here, what food should I avoid if I have thyroid disease? Okay, essentially, if you have hyperthyroidism, excessive amounts of iodine can actually cause uh, the problem to worsen. Um, foods such as seaweed, kelp, shellfish, which are excessive in consumption can worsen the hyperthyroid state. Whereas if you're, you have hypothyroidism or low thyroid hormone, taking a lot of cruciferous vegetables such as broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts and cabbage in excessive amounts can actually worsen the situation as well. So the key to it is moderation in all the kinds of foods that you eat. And in hyperthyroid patients, we try to avoid um, excessive iodine such as seaweed and excessive um, seafood consumption. So I hope I've uh, answered that question as well. Any more questions? I have higher heart rate. Once in a while, it goes as high as 110. Any concerns for thyroid problem? Okay, having a heart rate as high as 110 may not just mean thyroid problems. It can mean a lot of other things. Having anemia, having heart issues, as well as other abnormalities may also point to a high heart rate. So I suggest you get your blood screened, a baseline blood screen for your full blood count, kidney, liver function, as well as thyroid function test, and also get an ECG done to check on your heart rate and rhythm, and then take it from there. It may or may not mean thyroid problems. It can mean a myriad of other things as well. We have time for one more question. Is radioactive iodine life-threatening and dangerous? Okay, this is a very, very uh, interesting question. Okay, the doses that they deliver for hyperthyroid patients to go into remissions are very low. It is as low as 10 to 20 MCIs, sometimes 30 MCIs. That's the maximum that they go. However, for thyroid cancers, they go to much higher, such as 150 and beyond that for treatment of thyroid cancers. So the radiation amount that is delivered in the radioactive iodine therapy is very low and it specifically targets your thyroid cells. So it's actually a very safe procedure and it's just a day procedure. It requires you to go for the treatment and you can come back on the same day after taking the radioactive iodine therapy. There are a lot of um, uh, precautions and a lot of instructions given to patients before radioactive iodine therapy. One of it is 
um, staying away from seafood for at least 10 to 14 days prior to that to ensure that um, there is adequate concentration of the radioactive iodine in the thyroid to render it hypothyroid later on. So a lot of things to be followed very carefully when you go for radioactive iodine therapy and you shouldn't get pregnant within six months of radioactive iodine therapy as well. We have another question here. Will thyroid affect male hormone or not? Yes, thyroid hormones can affect both males and females in terms of fertility as well as um, sexual function as well. So get it checked. Hypothyroidism especially can affect uh, fertility for females. And yes, definitely it affects hormonal function for males as well as um, erectile function as well. So all the hormones in our body need to be in an optimal condition for normal sexual function. So I hope I've uh, answered all the questions today. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope everyone benefited from this talk today. If there are no other questions, thank you very much.